Hello again, and welcome back to another episode of the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gossain here with my brother and co-host Rohit Gossain. Today, we're having an exciting discussion focusing on a recent approval for patients with extensive stage small cell lung cancer. Rahul, a lot has changed in short time for this particular disease. Today, we are going to take a closer look at the most recent FDA approval of terlatumab, one of the first biospecific antibodies to be approved in solid malignancies. To cover this, we have Dr. Misty Shields from Indiana University, who will help us break down the study design, efficacy of the treatment, and of course, we will touch on operational challenges around this drug. Misty, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be here, Rohit and Rahul. It's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for small cell lung cancer and an opportunity to spread some good news for our patients and their families. Absolutely. Missy, welcome. Missy, let's start off with the drug makeup here. And then if you can also walk us through the study design itself for Delphi or Delphi 301. Yeah, absolutely. So Delphi 301 was a phase two open label multi uh, center multi cohort study. As you can see here, the key inclusion criteria were patients who had diagnosis of extensive stage small cell lung cancer with prior treatments of at least two or more lines of therapy, including a platinum-based doublet chemotherapy. Um, performance status by ECOG was zero or one with measurable disease and treated or in stable brain mats were allowed. Patients, 99 patients were enrolled in a one-to-one -one randomized fashion. And you can see here the part one and then the further dose expansion you can see here. Uh, that was 10 milligrams or 100 milligrams to cohorts. These patients were then followed for primary endpoint of objective response rate and by RASIST criteria and looking at tarlatumab serum concentrations. Secondary endpoints were disease or duration of response, disease control rate, progression-free survival by blind independent uh, review and overall survival. Then there was a co expanded uh, dose expansion cohort, as you see here on the 10 milligram dose for this study. Thank you, Missy, for laying that very important foundation for us. The approved regimen is actually 10 milligrams dose every two weeks. At least for cycle one, you start off with one milligram on day one, followed by 10 milligrams on day eight and day 15. And beyond that, it's 10 milligrams every two weeks. When, walking, when talking about the study design, I'm going to reiterate what you just stated. That is, the primary endpoint was objective response rate, which is rather critical as the approval here is an accelerated approval. We will need longer-term data and bigger studies to ensure that there is an ongoing benefit for our patients, and these patients are indeed living longer because of this intervention. Okay, Ms. T, what did the study show? Yes, so absolutely. So what we see here is the progression-free survival and overall survival. So this was uh, reported in New England Journal last year in 2023 uh, by the investigators. And what we see is that uh, there was an improvement in progression-free survival. These are two cohorts uh, without the you know, standard arm uh, here control, but these are compared against each other with a progression-free survival of spanning from 3.9 to 4.9 months. We see an overall survival here dramatic. This is 14.3 months and not uh, yet achieved here in the 100 milligram dose. And so not, not yet a valuable here. And so what we see is that what's reported out was an overall response rate of 40% in this patient population with a median duration of response of 9.7 months. So when patients had a response, it was very durable, very long lasting. Some patients on the study up to 20 months and counting on this phase two open label study. Very exciting results here. Yeah, no, these are exciting times. As you've mentioned, 40% objective response rate. And we've started to see a hint of overall survival benefit here already. A few things to mention. In this particular study, we had two doses, 10 milligrams and 100 milligrams, but the approval moving forward is for 10 milligrams. When we're talking about objective response, the other thing that we have to keep in mind here, this is all coming at a cost and some unique side effects that are associated with bispecific antibodies. When we're talking about bispecific antibodies, here, this particular one is for DLL3 and T cell engager. So, Missy, can you touch a little on um, the makeup of this particular drug, and then we'll take a dive into the side effects? Yes, so this is a bispecific T cell engager. It is designed to interact with CD3 on the immune cells, as well as uh, DLL3 on the small cell lung cancer surfosome. 
And so the design of this is unique and it's a class of its own that needs to be monitored and managed appropriately with appropriate uh, standard operating procedures and institutional guardrails to make sure that patients are safe and uh, cared for appropriately. And so with that, you know, we are watching for what we, the FDA has highlighted as black box warnings, including the cytokine release syndrome, as well as the uh, eye cans or effector cell uh, neurotoxicity that can be potentially seen with this class of molecules. Even before we go there, coming back to the same idea of the structure of this drug because of the T-cell engager and looking for that DLL3 on small cell, DLL3 is expressed heavily on small cell lung cancer. However, here we were seeing response regardless of that expression. Yeah, absolutely. So what we know is that DLL3 is uh, ubiquitous and abundant in small cell lung cancer. Anywhere in the reports between 70 and in the study actually was reported out at World Lung this year, ranging from a positive DLL3 of about 95% in the patients on this phase two study. So it seems like it is a really abundant protein, potentially more enriched in an ASCL1 subtype for neuroendocrine subtyping with small cell lung cancer. And so it, this is a great target. It's clearly a very efficacious target and it's needed for the small cells. Uh, to survive, and so therefore a nice vulnerability to target and go after. And certainly, and that's what dictates the response rate itself because of the targeted um, the option available here. Uh, Mr. most of the patients do get treated out in the community. Rahul and I are community oncologists. Though we are tied up with tertiary care center, we don't have a standalone hospital that is attached to our cancer center. When you talk about the operational challenges, with you, what you stated with CRS and ICANS, these are some concerning side effects. How are you partnering up with your community oncologist? Have you partnered up already or that is still in pipeline? Yes, absolutely. So we do have uh, a tarlatumab in active use at Indiana University where I practice at Simon Comprehensive Cancer Center here in Indianapolis. And we have partnered with our uh, colleagues who are practicing in uh, rural and community practices. You know, it is a partnership. These are patients who have been known to that oncologist and then potentially had a, a, a bad outcome on a scan and then are getting referred in for a new line of treatment. So these are patients we're meeting already in their treatment course. And so really building that rapport, building that understanding of what matters most to these patients, and then being able to have an open, candid discussion about what this treatment looks like, what it all entails, and then what are the logistics surrounding it, what are the opportunities, what are the risks and benefits, and what, what should a patient know to make a, a decision, an informed decision for this treatment. And so with that, you know, we don't have a prediction model to say who's going to have cytokine release syndrome. What we know from this study was it is a median time about 13 hours. It is really typically in the first cycle and the couple couple cycles after that. You can see here with the with the outcomes of the study, it was really early on in cycle one and two that we see the emergence of cytokine release syndrome and that they were majority grade zero, grade one toxicities are low grade manageable by supportive medications such as fluids, antipyretics, uh, and monitoring in, a, in an inpatient setting. And so it's important to have standard operating procedures in place for safety so that we can provide the best, highest care for patients. And that may look like, you know, referring a patient in from communities so that they have the opportunity of these centers that have a higher volume and are seeing this more often, often to, to help reduce any missed opportunities or any outcomes that may be unfavorable for patients. And so really having a, a center with a high volume that is a tertiary quaternary center to be able to uh, implement this, have that 22 to 24 hour observation that we're seeing with the FDA really wanting to have that in place so that we do all the safest things to provide the best outcomes for patients and their uh, care partners. Absolutely. Misty, just so that I get this right, right now, are you seeing these patients from the community in your center on day one, day eight, 24 hour OBS, and then moving forward thereafter when they're getting every two weeks treatment, they go back to their community um, oncologists and their community settings. Is that the work play right now? So I think that is definitely a potential option. The patients I've had from the community have come and stayed just because of the current logistics of their outpatient um, and community oncologists, but I think that is a very reasonable opportunity. You know, I, th I would encourage those community sites to make sure that they work with their pharmacists. It's very much a multidisciplinary approach here 
to have the opportunity to have those medications on board, particularly tocilizumab, to have that available so that we can, uh, you know, if there is an emergence of a cytokine release in a later cycle, which isn't really, you know, data driven, but just potentially for safety to have that on site, uh, as well as to, to be informed and know those delayed toxicities, such as ICANs. We know that neurotoxicity in the trial emerged with a median time of 30 days. And so we want to really make sure that if we're sending those patients back to their outside or community oncologist or a rural oncologist, they feel comfortable with that monitoring and recognizing that and helping with that expected management. And I feel like Raul, well, we've seen very similar stuff happening in our hematological space where they Completely. patients have received something at tertiary care center, and once they're on maintenance, or at least we have gone out of the window of CRS, uh, then they can get this regimen out in community. So we'll see how it plays out in most of the community settings, but it's nice to see that, Misty, you are already employing this. Yes, absolutely. So we've had an, a number of patients here at IU. I know that other institutions like Moffitt are really leading the way. I think they were the first institution in the United States to offer Tarlabam outside of the expanded access program. So I think there's a lot of really great programs that are using this and having great experience with it. And so I think, you know, the more rollout, the more we all get familiar with it, this class of drugs and recognizing these symptoms early. I'm hoping this is gonna be a great opportunity for patients to have durable responses and best outcomes uh, with diagnosis of small cell. Absolutely. All right. So before we close, bringing it back to home, what does it really mean for us in the clinic and for our patients? The study design was for two uh, agents and beyond, but the approval is actually a little more loose, which it's a, it states second line and beyond. Here, we also have lorponectidin. Misty, how are you sequencing this today in your clinic? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you know, there's a few places where you would want to think about this in your algorithm. Of course, we know based on the study that patients who are platinum resistant, as well as patients who have platinum sensitive disease, benefited from tarlatumab regardless of their initial chemotherapy free interval between first line and uh, second line and beyond. And so that is, you know, probably not as much of a variable here for these patients who are going to be treated with tarlatumab. I'd like to think about a couple of variables, things like active infection or immunodeficiencies. We don't know what if, what that is going to look like, and that is not a safe um, patient population at this time to provide this. So patients with immunodeficiencies or active infections, untreated like hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, um, things uh, that were also excluded were patients who had active um, non-infectious pneumonitis, um, in, interstitial lung disease, as well as you know, symptomatic brain meds. And so those are, we have to follow the data and follow the trial. We also want to think about patients who have um, a high burden of disease that may not be the best patient that might, we don't know who's going to have cytokine release, but you could postulate that potentially more disease might result in more risk of cytokine release syndrome. And so when I think about my algorithm of these patients post-platinum who have potential relapse or recurrence of their extensive stage small cell lung cancer, you know, someone who has a brain metastasis as part of their relapse, that's someone I'm more leaning towards uh, tarlatumab because we know that larbnectin is too large. It's a semi-synthetic derivative from the C squared to get into the CNS. And so that might be a better patient for tarlatumab once those have been definitively managed. We just saw data from Ashvin Delati and the, and the investigators showing that those patients who had brain metastases continue to have ongoing response. Uh, with tarlatumab. So this is showing this intracranial response. So those are patients that, you know, they have brain metastases. I'm leaning more towards tarlatumab in the second line once those have been definitively managed. Otherwise, you know, if they have a high burden disease, let's try a few cycles of larbinectin. We have durable responders who have been on larbinectin. I have several myself, um, you know, 20 cycles, 25 cycles and ongoing. So we don't want to deny a patient who could potentially have a durable response to larbinectin as well. So really, having that conversation, thinking about these parameters, and really having an open discussion with patients as to what that might look like if you were to start a treatment that is going to require hospitalization and potentially referral to another you know, town or city or even potentially another state, depending on your location and access to those care. And we want to make that you know, open and, and as equitable and fair uh, to patients and remove any barriers to that as much as we can and, and getting this out. Uh, in centers that uh, feel comfortable with managing this and have that opportunity for inpatient monitoring on cycle one, day one, and cycle one, day eight. 
Absolutely. Misty, as a generalist, I get to see GI, GU. One question that's going to come up is now I have access to this. Can I use this for high-grade neuroendocrine tumor from other sites, especially knowing that DLL3 is overexpressed in that particular population? Have you, would you use it outside clinical trial? Yeah, I think, you know, that is definitely where the field is going. Um, there's a, a um, cousin molecule to this with Boringer Ingelheim that uh, Brixtamig that was just uh, given a name and presented at World Lung this year. You know that is particularly looking at this high-grade neuroendocrine, large cell neuroendocrine, extrapulmonary, small cell carcinomas, and so they are looking at this in a trial setting. I think without a trial, it's going to be a little bit dicey to get this probably approved for the outside the indication by the FDA since it was for extensive stage small cell lung cancer. But I think that's where the field is going. We really want to see this, you know, expand, especially for those patients with large cell neuroendocrine who are potentially maybe run out of treatment options as it is a more difficult disease to treat. And so I think that's where the field is going. I don't think we have that just yet. Misty, before we close, any last minute thoughts from your end, please? Yes, absolutely. So just a small shameless plug for a patient advocacy group that's partnership with Longevity Small Cell Smashers. It's a new patient advocacy group to help patients and their care partners who are diagnosed and living with small cell lung cancer. We want to support you. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, tell your patients about it. We would love to have opportunities to provide good education, information, hope, and a voice in a future for these patients and their care partners. We have an upcoming speaker series coming up uh, this month uh, with Dr. Ann Chang. We have uh, Dr. Christine Lovely, Dr. Traparna Sen. A lot of exciting speakers coming up talking about the biology, the treatments, the outcomes, the you know multimodal, multidisciplinary therapy for small cell lung cancer. So give us a follow, give us a like, and listen to us on Facebook or on podcasts for more information and more support for patients with small cell. Dr. Shields, thank you so much for taking the time to dissect this recent approval and sharing your valuable insights. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap from today's discussion. In today's discussion with Dr. Misty Shields from Indiana University, we had a chance to focus on the recent approval of terlatumab in extensive stage small cell lung cancer based off Delphi 301 study. This accelerated approval is based off exciting objective response seen with terlatumab, a bispecific antibody towards DLL3 and CD3 T cell. DLL3 is expressed heavily in small cell lung cancer, but this approval is for all extensive stage small cell lung cancer patients, regardless of this expression. Yes, the current approval is based off of the objective response rate, but we need to be very mindful about the side effects we see with this biospecific agent, cytokine release syndrome or CRS, and immune cell-associated neurotoxicity syndrome, ICAMS, can be serious, and managing these for now in inpatient setting is extremely important. We will eagerly await on more mature data and larger studies using this agent. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for more discussions around the recent approvals and practice change data. We are the Oncology Brothers.